So there's this idea with the cloud that it can provide heavy, VX, heavy VFX capability to small groups of people and individuals. Um, but when I tried to exercise the cloud in this way for myself, I found that I actually couldn't do that. Uh, when I had to consider the needs of a heavy effects workflow and just what that needs in terms of storage and how that type of infrastructure might work, I actually couldn't do it about a year and a half ago. <clears throat> Excuse me. So without direct control of the resource that we pay to use, we don't have the flexibility to do what we want. And if we're paying for rendering services, we also end up paying more than the base price of that resource, which means that it does scale poorly. Um, and without any high expense in the development in order to have that direct control, um, then the base price of the resource just isn't available. Thank you. So this ends up putting a, a tier of efficiency that isn't available to the nimble and to the small groups of people or individuals um, because you have to end up paying for uh, an overhead uh, for intermediary rendering services. Um, also, those rendering services are probably providing you with um, an environment that isn't coherent with your own environment that might be on site and it probably doesn't give you the ability to be bleeding edge. It may also end up uh, isolating you from the resource that you're paying for through an interface. And when we're talking about trying to integrate something like PDG, that just wouldn't do for me. Uh, perhaps some of the shared problems that I had with large companies as well is that uh, a lot of solutions for heavy workflows involve vendor lock-in type dependencies that could limit further flexibility. Um, so. For example, a lot of expensive uh, storage solutions that might work on Google might not work well on AWS. Also, high-end storage solutions often don't scale down to near zero idle cost. Uh, so being able to have flexibility and being able to choose my own storage solution and being able to adapt rapidly for that was really important to me. So my feeling is, considering these things, that the cloud should be able to provide the same scale architecture uh, to individuals as large companies, um, since if we can use infrastructure as code to describe the entire digital infrastructure of an entire company now, there are plenty of companies that are doing this, then with open source, then the cost of that investment in human time could be distributed. So with open source digital infrastructure as code, we can also have better, more bleeding edge ability without those vendor lock-in type controls. Um, tools like HashiCorp Terraform, which is an open source framework for spinning up cloud infrastructure, treats the cloud providers as plugins. So with that as a basis, we're kind of well positioned in the future to be able to implement flexibility with other cloud providers so long as they use Terraform as a means of being able to provision them. If someone's trying to sell me render time, I tell them, do you use Terraform? Or I ask them if, I do, if they use Terraform, and that's usually the direction that I point someone in now. And as an example of this implementation, I, I provide uh, the code on GitHub for the demo that I'm running today. It is an ad hoc implementation in terms of some of the configuration but there's nothing stopping me from being able to break that out and generalize it further in the not too distant future. So Open Firehawk is an open approach for direct control of cloud resources in visual effects and computing. And using Terraform and also another tool named Ansible uh, by Red Hat, we can provision systems in similar ways across different cloud providers and also on our own on-site infrastructure. So aside from democratizing direct access to compute as a commodity, it's designed to scale economically. So we want access to those, those cores at the base price of the resource, optimizing for spot instances or preemptible nodes. Those node types mean that you can get booted in the middle of an operation. Uh, and so there are a few things to, 
to consider with that moving forward. And I'll come across that later. Um, one of the other important uh, considerations with Open Firehawk was ensuring flexibility with storage choices. So um, being able to have very low idle cost is really important. I want to be able to also then scale up something like a virtual remote NAS appliance up to many, many terabytes, maybe even petabytes. And I also want to be able to access that virtual NAS appliance with speeds of 100, uh, sorry, one gigabyte per second or more. The other consideration with Open Firehawk is perhaps a responsibility over greater time for it to be a boilerplate for implementing security standards. Uh, like ensuring that your compute occurs in a private network and that we implement best practices where possible, especially if the infrastructure is used uh, with, with multiple people or multiple small studios, it, it would make it potentially easier for us to um, pay for penetration testing or have shared um, funding for security on um, for improvements to security in the infrastructure. And the project is currently Linux focused, and that has a lot to do with the cost of Windows in the cloud being considerably more expensive, uh, and also problems with Windows in, with, when it comes to automation. Uh, but if you did need to use Windows, it would be possible for you to still build images into render nodes and scale up uh, Windows-based render nodes. It's just not how we're provisioning the infrastructure in general. So I'm going to I'm going to demonstrate a, a maiden flight of this project as of last week, and it's currently an automated rollout for a small network that I'm running at home, with some settings that are still ad hoc. Um, it's not yet generalised for ease of public use, and it's not a ready solution for all. But you can see how the implementation works, and you can start to learn some of the tools that I've implemented here in order to, for us to potentially collaborate in the future and allow this to be more easily shared amongst others. Uh, I also intend to run a webinar or hangout uh, for questions because I probably won't have enough time for questions today. So uh, I'll, I'll provide some more details on that later. So, in this test, Open Firehawk's providing uh, a foundation and infrastructure for, it's providing all the automation for the infrastructure that the demo is running off. So from scratch, I can, with the Open Firehawk virtual machine, uh, we can spin up all of the infrastructure in the cloud, fully automate the installation of our software like Houdini. Uh, we can install multiple versions of Houdini. We can install the daily build. We can scale out a daily build that just dropped within 30 minutes and have it running on render nodes. And side effects as PDG plays an important role here because it, it demonstrates how the cloud can be more interactive and flexible in a hybrid scenario. And then for part two, I'm going to go into DevOps, a kind of DevOps intro for TDs or enterprising people that may not be versed in some of the lingo and give you a bunch of resources if it's something that excites you or something that you'd like to learn. So this animation test I, I ran quite a while back. The first time I built this, uh, I, I ran it on a MacBook Pro and there's 10 million particles and the 100 frames or so were generated over a 24 hour period. Then later I, when PDG was released, I I tested it on a cloud workstation using the local scheduler. And in this scenario, we're extending it further, um, making it a little heavier, and we're using it across a hybrid infrastructure. So PDG is going to run a hybrid dependency between the workstation on Adelaide and the Open Firehawk cloud infrastructure uh, running in Sydney. This is an overview of our PDG workflow, and our goal is to generate some of the light data locally, and we're going to generate heavier simulation remotely, and we're going to create a workflow where we can avoid having to transfer the heavy simulation, which is 60, uh, sorry, 70 gigabytes. Uh, we don't have to pull that back home. We're going to run eight remote dependencies per as a per-frame dependency, uh, and we're going to show multiple post-processing stages
also using Mantra being scaled up on a spot fleet. Then, as the frames finish, we're going to automatically uh, download the rendered frames on the fly to our local storage in order to review them uh, while the simulation is still running concurrently in the cloud. And there's no reason why this graph couldn't work in PDG standalone uh, with other software like Maya or any other automation that could be run from a shell or a Python script. So I use a right-click menu script so that when I submit a tree, I always submit my pre-flight nodes before we run the tree. And that's just to break them out of a dependency so that whenever there's a change to the pre-flight, it doesn't necessarily dirty the data downstream and make PDG think it needs to be reevaluated. We're just synchronizing very light stuff in this step, in this step, just the hip file and any Python scripts required for submission, but any heavy assets can be handled later. And to leverage my local system, I'm going to generate the source locally, or these two sources locally. And since it's light data, I want to leverage PDG's low latency when it's being used as a local scheduler. And we then have a downstream dependency that's handing, handling a file copy over the VPN uh, with an NFS mount that is available locally, but it's slow, if it's relatively slow. So we want to be careful about how often we move heavy data across our VPN connection. And that's what PDG is doing here. I think one of the other interesting things that emerged from this experiment was how it also enables me to leverage my bandwidth over a longer duration. I only need the first frame before up there before the simulation can start. The, the following frames can continue after that point. So in terms of the way bandwidth gets used, that's really efficient because it's distributed over the course of the simulation if you find you're exceeding your own bandwidth limitations. So then down from there, the simulation will run on a 72 thread spot instance. And instead of before, where we're going to render it at 2K, we'll render it at 4K. We'll run 190 frames. And we're going to use a total of four, 560 core hours uh, over the course of one hour for the shot. And all of these nodes are preemptible, uh, which means that they're 70% cheaper on average. Uh, and there's a risk that we could get booted while we're running it, but I actually haven't ever been preempted in any test that I've run. Uh, there's definitely options that we've got if that were to occur. At the point where I find that's an issue for me, um, the options that I'd be considering are, for example, we can store simulation data, uh, sim data every 20th frame to recover. Uh, also, in AWS, in the current implementation, uh, it, is, it is possible to hibernate a, a node before it gets preempted. So when you get booted, provided you're using less than 120 gigs of RAM, it is possible to save the memory state um, before you get preempted. I haven't leveraged that because I haven't had a need to do it, but it's good to know that that capability is there and super useful. So we can also do some QC of that data. Uh, in this case, I'm happy to download every 10th frame on the fly. So as a dependency, I am copying every 10th frame of the heavy SIM data generated remotely for quality control. There are other types of quality control that we could leverage, like using remote GPUs to generate flipbooks, which I haven't yet implemented into a scaling group. But I will show you a remote GPU on a, on a workstation. Um, we can also do things like drop the mantra uh, resolution down to a quarter and um, drop the sampling so that we can have highly interactive um, mantra renders to review the remote data. And as we process the post-sim caching stages, we're going to be generating IFDs and our mantra renders. And as each frame completes, we can see that data on both a local NFS mounted volume and the remote. NFS mounted volume. So all storage is always accessible from all locations. It doesn't matter where you are. But that Firehawk sync node down the bottom left there, the light gray one, is handling the file copy to the other mounted, to the mounted location that's local to me. Then 
We also have a Firehawk sync node to the right that's set to synchronize the data up to cloud storage. In, in this type of workflow, I have a tendency to want to just destroy the NAS at the end of the day when I'm done with it and save myself on those idle costs rather than have a bunch of volumes that I'm being charged for. So I tend to want to push all my data up to S3 cloud storage and pull it back down the next day. I treat, I treat um, my S3 cloud storage as my production store and this is everything else is volatile or ephemeral and will be blown away. But it's also totally possible to just keep the NAS available. Uh, we can turn it off and we won't be charged for license costs. We're paying per gigabyte hour that the NAS is on. So it's uh, with SoftNAS, uh, which is what I'm currently using for storage, that actually is, is a very economical way to scale up and down. Then finally, when all of the frames are available locally, we will um, produce an MPEG. So something else that's kind of counterintuitive is with a procedural workflow, it actually makes a lot of sense to often run simulations in multiple locations because procedurally generating the data in multiple locations is probably more cost effective and time effective um, than copying the data over a more limited bandwidth uh, web connection. Uh, so in my scenario, also considering the cost of remote GPUs, uh, I'm perfectly happy to leverage my local GPU uh, to keep my core, my, my price per core hour um, cost down. So I can run sims in both locations and I have, I, I know that I've got the data in both locations available and I can use uh, a local flipbook for quality control. So these are just the rudimentary sources. One is injecting velocity into a fluid sim. The other source is injecting actual points. Uh, about 10 million or so is the total point count that we end up getting. And then after the sim completes, we've got two post processes. One that's just um, blurring and softening um, some of the particles so that they look like a volume, even though we're just rendering the 10 million particles. And then we've got uh, another post process that's sniping out a few embers and um, altering uh, their, their representation so that they, so that they render uh, properly. So when not in use, uh, the infrastructure's spun down, everything's turned off. And when we want to spin it up, we use Terraform Apply. We have a bunch of secrets stored in local in environment variables in that virtual machine, and those secrets aren't meant to leave the virtual machine. They're stored in an encrypted state. So Terraform Apply at this point is turning on all the render nodes. It's mounting three 200 gigabyte SSDs for us to uh, use on our NAS, our virtual NAS appliance, and we're configuring them in RAID 0. The state of the NAS is in version control, so if I decide that I'm going to go to RAID 6 and I want double redundancy, I can do that, and I can change whether or not I want to use standard, um, more economical drives instead of SSDs. Uh, I have often, I've usually run with RAID 6 until this point so that I can also scale up my NAS as my consumption increases. So the wake and sleep process, spinning up a NAS, closing it down at this point, it takes about six minutes. And once it's up, we can run a submission. So it's 8.16 now. If you just want to, if you want to keep tabs on what I'm doing with my video editing, you can, you can see the time in the top right. So we're submitting our pre-flight. And... The first stage is copying it to the remote NAS. The second stage is pushing it up to S3 cloud storage because that's our permanent record of what's actually occurred. And, and once that synchronization is completed, then we're going to be able to run our local sources. So as soon as frame one of each source is completed, uh, we're going to be running a file copy up to AWS. Uh, 
And as soon as those two frames are available, the simulation is able to start remotely. The partition by index node is unifying those work items. That's what describes the connection between those two separate sources. So frame one, frame one of both sources is available and the simulation is able to start. At this point, deadline will see a task in the queue and there won't be any render nodes assigned to that group. So deadline will scale up our spot fleet in order to do the work. If we open up deadline pulse, we can observe how that's being how that's being done. So deadline is free to use in AWS, by the way, even if you are using it on your own infrastructure. And that's the reason why I've selected it so far. OpenQ was launched after I'd already begun implementation of deadline. And at the moment, I have to be quite focused on where I put my energy. So um, deadline, is, deadline has been my scheduler of choice uh, for AWS so far. And the way that it scales up spot fleets uh, as an embedded function is, is quite useful. So it's set um, a spot fleet to go and grab us one 72 thread node. It takes about five to six minutes from the point where frame one arrived, was able to be computed, and that node actually arrived and completed the first work item. So from the request going through to the first frame of the sim completing was about five, it will be about five or six minutes. We've also got our local sim running and our local flipbook being generated. So we can review what is actually going to be processed remotely and we have the ability to intercept and kill what's going on. And that's one of the most important things with what PDG gives us is that interactivity and the ability for an artist to intercept the first, at the first simulation, just 10% through if they don't like what's happening. That, that gives us real world changes to artist iteration times that in my opinion are often an order of magnitude higher than what people are used to. It's not just about iteration time anymore. It's actually about time to failure. It's, it's a totally different way of thinking. So that, that node has arrived and we can actually view the log um, as it's occurring. That node is on a different subnet, but it's addressable from my network. I can ping it, I can SSH into it, if I want to do something like run an S trace to find out why something weird's going on, I, I, can, I can do that. So we're six minutes in and we've, we've completed the first task. And now downstream from that, we've got more tasks that are able to run now. So we're going to have another spot fleet request go through because I only want eight thread nodes from here on. And we're also going to run uh, concurrent tasks on those eight thread nodes. So we will actually run two tasks to each eight thread node. So there's our request for our next node. As PDGMQ starts, once PDGMQ has started, then it's going to also fill up the queue with with other tasks behind it. So the first work item's ready there. We're able to also then go downstream. I'm just checking out the local flip book again, just to make sure that I'm happy with what I'm seeing. One wedge, yeah. So I'm time lapsing here just to move through um, the latency that we see. We see five minutes between each stage, where it's eight. It's almost eight forty at, at this point in time, and we're, we've got requests going through for our first mantra, our first mantra nodes. Meanwhile, we can also check in on every tenth frame of our simulation data that was downloaded from the remote location. <coughs> 
So I'm time lapsing forward a little bit here, but we've got uh, 30. We've got a request for 36 um, mantra nodes to start to help out with the work. I'm also running two concurrent mantra frames on each on each render node there. And now that the first frame is finished, we've got a few frames that have downloaded while the simulation is actually still running. So we've got 72 sim frames to go, but we are able to review local data now. And we also have uh, the synchronization up to our cloud storage, which is using a Python library called Botto uh, for AWS, which allows you to synchronize uh, to and from S3. It also avoids operations, um, unnecessary copy operations if, if the data's either in one of those locations already. However, I do think that just using the sync operation, even if the data is in both locations, it counts as a request. So that's why some companies use databases to track whether or not something's been synchronized already. That's something I'd probably look at in the future once I find that the request count is something that's a significant cost. It's something that we really need to try and figure out how to do that for free too. <laughs> so we've got half the frames that have returned. We can review them on a 4K display, on a 4K display at 10 bit. And we can also open up a partial sequence. We've got about 60% or 75% done at 9.10. Everything completes within the next two minutes from this point. Um, at 9.12, everything did finish. I ended up jumping ahead to 9.15. After two minutes of idle time, those nodes are going to close down. We've got our FFmpeg that we can review. So for that run, we used a total of 560 core hours, and we can review the cost of each spot fleet, which is it's not a set cost. It's kind of like a free market where people bid a very low price in general on the, on the cost of those nodes and you get them at a heavily discounted rate. But as more and more people join, then if, if, they ended, if, they, if the algorithm ends up determining that they're going to pay a higher price than you for the node, then you will be preempted. Or so is my understanding of it anyway. So we can see the prices there for each deadline group. And this cost a total of $8.35 US. So that equated to about 1.5 cents per core hour. And this doesn't include license costs or other if infrastructure costs. If I was to use a managed service, which would have been far less efficient uh, anyway because of the PDG limitations, I would have been looking anywhere from, um, say, two and a half to eight times that price. So the other, the other costs apart from our licenses that we need to consider, and keep in mind you can run an engine license on something like a 96 thread node, so you can actually get quite a lot out of an engine license in the cloud. Uh, we would have, if I had my infrastructure spun up all day and I was using it all day with that 600 gig NAS on the other side, I would usually see somewhere between eight and $12 uh, in total to, to keep that up for the 600 gig NAS with SoftNAS. And SoftNAS, the license fee would have been about $1 of that, of that uh, in terms of licensing. And that would obviously be more as we were to scale up our storage. You pay per gigabyte hour for SoftNAS. In terms of costs of EBS volume price, if you're using standard hard drives for EBS volumes that you're mounting to your NAS, it's actually pretty close to the price that you pay for S3 cloud storage. It's just that the difference is that it's, it's provisioned. You've, you're paying for, say, a terabyte, because you say you want a terabyte. It doesn't matter how much you're actually using. You're, you're paying for it. Whereas S3 cloud storage, we're only paying for what we use. So that's why I'm particularly interested in optimizing for that as my product, general production data store or offlining of data that isn't live. <laughs> 
Uh, I should also say that um, I think that it looks like we could probably reduce the cost of that idle infrastructure cost there. If it was 8 to $12 for a whole day of usage, uh, we, we could probably use lower instance types. And if I was to run something like four iterations over the day, we'd be looking at about two cents per core hour. Uh, if I was to only spin up the infrastructure just for one run, which is pretty rare, but let's say that was what we were doing, it would also be about two cents per core hour on this run. And, and that price can fluctuate depending on availability. So when I want to shut everything down and lower my idle costs, I pass a sleep variable through to the Terraform script. Uh, when sleep is true, everything gets shut down. And I have another variable that asks whether or not I want to destroy the NAS volumes and remove them. So my, my version controlled infrastructure code will will end up uh, destroying the NAS volume in order to save those idle costs. And then I usually, at the moment, I pay like, I don't know, it's 10 or 20 cents a day or something as an idle cost if I do that. If I don't want to pay that 10 or 20 cents a day, I can just destroy the entire infrastructure with a terraform destroy command. And because it's all version controlled, I'm not too afraid of doing that. And it usually, if I need to spin up the infrastructure from scratch, uh, it usually takes about an hour to an hour and a half, and that would include the provisioning of a render node, the provisioning of uh, my workstation, uh, and also the provisioning of SoftNAS and OpenVPN, because it's also it's automatically configuring all of this stuff for you so that OpenVPN just works. It's also automatically installing the deadline database on the Open Firehawk server. It's automatically installing the deadline remote connection server. So it's trying to handle all of this stuff uh, under version control. So to extend that use case uh, to other possible scenarios, if you think about the cost of simulation compared to the cost of rendering, simulation is actually, it's really cheap. Even if it takes a long time, it's actually usually a relatively cheap cost compared to the price of rendering. It just takes a long time. And in terms of what I think is low hanging fruit for how companies can keep people iterating and keep artists happy and, and functional, it, it's, probably, it's probably the lowest hanging fruit to allow them to be able to simulate in the cloud in, in similar ways to like we've shown now. Like if I was running uh, destruction simulations and I only needed the transforms to come back, that's such light data, it would just feel like being on site. If you had to do dynamic fracturing, that would be a slightly different scenario. And if you've got a high speed internet connection like most companies would, that still wouldn't necessarily be a problem. Um, considering also things like uh, flip scenarios where we're simulating water or uh, with flip and we're simulating our white water, you might have secondary and tertiary, tertiary simulations that are running off that. Uh, we're now able to run those scenarios in PDG as a per frame dependent simulation. So we're not waiting for that first sim to finish. Um, someone who's running water simulations and able to see uh, rendered frames coming off the back of that is probably, it's, it's pretty normal for them to be able to kill a simulation after 30% of the way through because they can already tell if the tuning of the behavior is, is right. And then it's only when you're starting to get towards finishing stuff that you end up needing to run the simulation all the way through. So I just want to also demo um, running a remote workstation in this scenario. I haven't automated um, the scaling of GPUs for rendering yet. I don't expect that to be too difficult. Um, but in this case, we'll spin up a, a remote workstation. And because my workstation's out of date, I hadn't used it for a while, uh, I wanted to pick up the latest daily build that was available on this day. So I use a, a taint command to tell Terraform that the state of that system is useless and just please go and get me another one. So Terraform apply will then go and spin up uh, another instance. Uh, it'll destroy the old one spin up a new uh, remote GPU instance. And then 
it will use Ansible to go and uh, provision that node in very, very much the same way as I provision my own workstation. I only have a few variables that are different. It's more or less configured in the same way as I configure my local workstation. So when a daily build drops, uh, I, I have it running on my local workstation, my remote workstation, and my render nodes within about 30 minutes. And I'm able to scale up render tests. Uh, I apologize for the compression I said on this video. Um, this remote session actually had a lot higher quality display than what you're seeing here. Um, but we can see in the remote workstation now, I'm connected over a MacBook Pro. We've got our NAS mounts in both locations. I've unfortunately forgot to rename it. I used to be in Cannes when I started doing this and then I moved to Adelaide. So it's still called Cannes Prod. Um, so now I'm able to load up the exact same scene file. And we had, I did a ping test before, I, d I didn't talk about that, but I wanted to check that the latency was decent. We got a ping test from Adelaide to Sydney of 27 milliseconds, which is really good. For network editing, I'm still, I still find it's fine at 40. I think once it starts to get above that though, then it's not quite the same user experience. And so we are able to interact with that sim data uh, on my MacBook Pro, I'm connected to an instance that has 120 gigs of RAM and 16 threads and 20 gigabit per second of Ethernet connection to the NAS. Uh, so I, I can do something like alter a camera move or um, manipulate some of that heavy data remotely. Perhaps I'm not happy with some of the post-processing that took place. And I could run a remote flipbook uh, for a quick QC test and close down that remote workstation as soon as I want because they are still quite costly. So I find remote workstations can be really economical if they're used sparingly. Compared to uh, having a 1080 Ti locally though, it's, it's a common problem that I would find that it looks like GPUs just cost too much for me to use them in the cloud I, or to want to use them too much. Uh, it does cost me quite a, quite, a, quite a decent amount to do that. I should also note that it's possible to save quite a bit off uh, the GPU instance in the cloud um, by purchasing a license from Teradici for around two or two fifty, two hundred or two hundred and fifty dollars per year, you can eliminate the license cost. And I've also seen that there are some cheaper GPU instances that are available now that I've I've yet to test. Um, so, to I guess translate this to other scenarios, depending on like your size as a studio or if you're an individual. Uh, even if you've got one Houdini effects license and you're able to produce IFDs locally, you can use PDG to synchronize um, your scene data and those IFDs up to the cloud and scale up Mantra as much as you can keep it fed, which is going to be limited to the size of the internet connection and the size of the scene that you're trying to get done there. But with just one uh, Houdini effects license, it's possible to do that. Um, our engine licenses are Global, global access licenses, they're able to be floating to produce simulation. Uh, and if we're using a local access license, um, I can, like we just demonstrated, I shut down my local workstation, I shut down, sorry, I shut down my local Houdini session, and then I was able to pick up that license in the cloud over the VPN. And then I think, well, something I already touched on before is the possibility in the future of being able to support other providers like Google Cloud Platform uh, or Microsoft. So this next part of my talk, um, I want to kind of introduce people that might be enterprising and might want to figure out how to maintain their own cloud infrastructure uh, by introducing uh, some concepts and lingo to TDs that you might not be familiar with. I knew nothing about this stuff about a year and a half ago. and. Um, I think something that I learned about halfway through that 
was really important and it took me much further was about halfway through I realized that I was just learning a lot more if I tried to put on something that was way over my head. Even if, if, I, if I was learning from a tutorial that I understood actually really very little about but I needed to get versed in a new tool, it was, it was actually just far more useful for me to put on something that was way above my level because even if I just gave myself permission to chill out, watch it on the projector with a beer and know that I might only get 10% of the information, it was able to show me the full capabilities of what I might do if I knew, once I fully understood that tool at least. And it also gave me an index in my head so I was able to Google questions pretty quickly. And so the, some of the tutorials here you might find uh, are difficult, but I would encourage you to embrace discomfort and, not, and just be cool with not understanding everything when you're going through it. And in time, you, it, it will make more sense. If, if you want to take a picture of that, you can. Um, we'll be showing it later. Um, but the tutorials on Pluralsight, Udemy, Linux Academy, on Terraform and Ansible uh, were all really useful. These books were also really good for Terraform and Ansible. And I'm happy to admit that before I started this project, my Git habits were terrible. And uh, I wanted to start to implement um, better habits and better workflow with Git and just having a, a better understanding of using it in the right way if I'm to consider how I would share my work with groups of people. Um, Picking up Visual Studio Code actually it taught me a lot. Um, having Git impl implemented into the UI, it, it starts to show you um, very intuitively how Git's working when it comes to branching models and commits. Being able to see um, diffs with prior commits is super useful. You've got your stash there that you can you know, save something that you might want to look at, look at later. Um, also, um, that link to a successful Git branching model, if you just punch that in Google, um, that introduced me to a workflow that I've started to adopt for a Git branching model. And then lastly, the Pluralsight uh, tutorial called Mastering Git was also uh, very, very handy. So open firewall components. Um, Red Hat Ansible allows us to do our provisioning and the configuration of all our systems. So it allows us to, in the, in the Linux environment, it allows us to install, install software packages, but also configure um, text files um, and permissions. Uh, so it can replace manual configuration. And any time that I find myself doing manual configuration, I, I just revert back to improving the Ansible automation scripts. Um, so if they're made properly, uh, it won't matter how many times they're run. It's, it's this concept, it's a really fancy big word called item potency, and it allows, it, the, the idea is that it doesn't really matter how many times something is run, the output should be the same, and it's meant to allow your systems to converge upon a particular state or end state, whatever state they may be in initially. Um, I found that the more I started to do this, it saved tremendous amounts of human labor. Um, from the beginning when I thought I would try and run my own cloud infrastructure manually and I realized how painful it was every time I needed to update something, as a single TD that's just not possible. And by automating everything it was really the only way I found that I could, I could handle that much infrastructure. So Terraform um, provides the means of getting our cloud infrastructure into a particular state. And like Ansible, it's trying to think about things in terms of state, but Ansible's more procedural. You're, you're dealing with um, figuring things out and saying what's going to be done. You are describing how to do it. Whereas Terraform, you're not really describing how to do things. You're just telling it what you want. So when I, when I tell Ansible in a script, I want two private subnets, two public subnets. I want you to drop a render node in there with that image and I want you to drop that NAS in there with that image. With pretty concise code, you're able to get Terraform to rapidly um, spin up a lot, of, a lot of resources. And it uses a 
uh, HashiCorp language, which is kind of a it's, a, it's a really nicely readable adaptation to deal with some of the issues of um, other scripting languages like YAML and JSON. Um, HashiCorp language is trying to sort of give you the best of both worlds. Um, so in terms of network topology, our, our cloud infrastructure sits within that, that 10, that 10 .000 range and the 10 255 .255 range. And our on-site um, IP ranges are in the 192.168 realm. So in AWS speak, which is my current implementation, and I chose AWS because there was a lot of learning material. It was very easy for me to pick up. I chose it initially as well um, because at the time I had no scheduler. I didn't have a choice for a scheduler. And being able to use Deadline as a free scheduler in AWS was incentivizing to me to pick something that was established. Um, that game's now really interesting and different now that OpenQ's on the scene, and that's something that I'm really excited to implement going forward as well. Um, but in AWS speak, um, an availability zone is a data center location. So in something like the region of Sydney, you have three uh, different availability zones. And that allows us to provision inf infrastructure in any of them or all of them to provide fault tolerance and redundancy against things like natural disasters, power outages, um, machinery going through fiber optics and things like that. Um, so Terraform or, or even CloudFormation for that matter allows you to spin up your infrastructure in any of those, any of those availability zones. I'm currently only, I think I'm only using one of those for the NAS, but it is possible for me to still access the NAS from the other availability zones. It's probably just not as efficient, and I haven't done any tests to find out what the, what the deal is there. Um, so the private subnets are where our production systems are located, and so we've got our uh, soft NAS instance, we've got our first render node that we end up building our image from that then scales out across the spot instances. And we've got our virtual workstations, which are basically the same. Uh, the idea being there that if I want to disable internet, internet access to those nodes, I can. Uh, and then we have our public subnets where any instances that have to be public facing for any reason, um, you might have a VPN there. Uh, you'd also have perhaps an SSH jump box, which allows you to SSH into the node on the outside before you SSH onto the node on the inside. That public subnet and having fewer instances for specific purposes out there allows us to reduce the attack surface for bad actors and it makes it easier for us to manage what potential vulnerabilities could get into our network that way. If best practices are implemented uh, which I still have a lot of work to do on, by the way, with my current infrastructure implementation. I, I think that it's probably more likely that the greatest risks come from our networks if we were running them at home. Uh, so it's really important for you to ensure that um, any systems that you don't control directly aren't on the same subnet as your VPN. So the NFS mounts uh, that are available at all locations the way we handle that looks something like this. So our SoftNAS instance might have a production volume that looks like cloud location prod or AWS Sydney prod. And then our on-site NAS or NFS share, doesn't have to be a NAS, um, might look like uh, Adelaide prod. And then slash prod is an alias or a bind mount to either of those two locations depending on which is more efficient. So then it's up to PDG or some other synchronization mechanism to ensure that the data that you're going to read or that you care about is, is accessible in the other location. So it is possible, for example, I would probably, if I was importing any assets into Houdini, I would probably focus on a workflow where PDG is aware of every asset so that you have work items that are trackable that are able to be copied to and from different locations or up and down from Amazon S3. Uh, rather than just loading them in with a file node, it probably makes sense to, well, if you did that, you 
probably have a Python script that could generate those as work items as well to make PDG aware of, of the assets to be handled. So th the next part is, uh, I've really covered all of this. Um, the guest subnet should be for any other systems that you don't control that are on site. Um, then the next part is our open Firehawk server. So that's running from uh, a virtual machine that is also under version control. So we use HashiCorp Vagrant, which allows us to use a Ruby script to describe that virtual machine. And it allows you to not just describe what image is being used to build the basis for the virtual machine, but also some basic provisioning, like what's its network con connectivity? What is it? Is it going to enable promiscuous mode on network cards so that it can behave as a router? And that's what the, this server does. It, it essentially operates as a router or a gateway uh, through to both locations. So I also have to set up uh, a static route on my router so that when I'm trying to ping anything in the 10,000 subnet realm, that we're routing that back through the virtual machine and then the virtual machine sending that through the VPN tunnel to the other side. And then the AWS side's easy because that's all automated. Those routes are handled in, in the infrastructure code. But your router is probably the one thing I can't automate because I don't know what it is. I don't know how to log into it. So it's the one thing you need to set up. And once it's set up, you won't need to worry about it. Um, these, these virtual machines are used as a, a basis or a platform for us to provision all our infrastructure from. And so we have one for dev and we have another virtual machine for production. And that's because I want my production environment that's being used live completely isolated from any changes or tests that I would do in my dev environment. And I also have them linked to totally different AWS accounts, which is kind of weird, but it's just a measure that I want to take. I don't want to take any risks about what code I could run with Ansible that could destroy infrastructure or um, code with Terraform. Terraform's less likely to do it because it's quite aware of what infrastructure it's created. But Ansible, there's no limits to what you would be able to do with it um, if you were altering the infrastructure in that way with it. Um, so I, I run both those virtual machines on my Mac. I want them separate from my workstation. It's important to have two different physical machines for that purpose because you're running a Mongo database for deadline in this server. You don't necessarily have to. You could, you could break it out and run it elsewhere, but you don't want out of memory issues to take out your Mongo database. It could end up corrupting it if it was in the middle of a write. So you do want to have um, isolated hardware for those purposes, no laptops on the beach for now. Um, uh, the, as for the image that we're, we're building off, we're using Ubuntu 16 only here. Well, I'm not using Ubuntu for render nodes or workstations. Everything else is built around CentOS. Um, but we chose Ubuntu 16 because uh, if I want support from OpenVPN, I can get it. They're much more familiar with that operating system. So that was a big plus because OpenVPN is quite complicated. Um, but I'm getting to the point where I'm going to have to wrap this up now. Um, so I guess I just want to like cover some of the reasons why, why I feel that doing things in this way works for me and why I feel it's an important way for us to consider thinking like moving forward as potential remote collaborators or, or even large companies as well. Um, if a large company ever wanted to pick this up, it would be a dream. But um, I, I guess one of the things is that like, it feels like to me that cloud nodes um, need to be just as capable as something that I own. And if I'm paying for that time using it, I want to be able to do whatever I want with it. And I wanted a basis for things like cloud simulation. I wanted to be able to run 24 terabytes of data if I wanted to. And I wanted to be able to produce very heavy visual effects shots. And I feel like this workflow is, is approaching that possibility. Um, being completely hybrid is extremely important for being um, efficient in terms of cost. 
At the point where you're using a resource more than 40% of the time, if you can do that for, say, a three-year period, you should probably be owning that resource, um, provided you have the means to share any input or output between the cloud and that it makes sense for you to do that. Um, so I wanted the choice over that and the components that I plug in, especially storage. Storage is, storage is just moving so rapidly all the time and I need a tremendous amount of flexibility with it and I don't want to be uh, forced into a particular solution. And I think also lastly, like why I, I want to open source it and why I feel that that's important is that I want to enable um, small groups of people to produce really big output and I wanted to have something that in the future might enable me to collaborate with others um, because open source can kind of help solve that problem about boundaries and who owns what. Uh, I wanted this to start to be the basis for how we think about highways between multiple small studios or maybe even large studios and remote artists as well. Um, I wanted to turn it into more like a free and open highway rather than these bridges that are controlled with various trolls along them. And I felt like that might be a little, a slightly different way of thinking about things um, and to, for, for us to collaborate on that infrastructure together. And then um, lastly as well, something that you know, came along the way was how automation extended those capabilities. And with version controlled infrastructure, the ability to maintain huge amounts of infrastructure as one, per, one person is, is totally possible. Um, so I hope this has been really interesting for you and if it's inspired you as much as I'm passionate about this project myself, if you'd like to help if you're a developer or if you're in systems or you're a pipeline TD at this stage, um, send me an email. My email is andrew at firehawkvfx.com and uh, if, if this is something that you feel like, well, maybe I'm not ready to dive in that deep, then uh, you could join up the mailing list and I'll I'll um, update you. And uh, then lastly, if you'd like to support me on Patreon, I would greatly appreciate your help. I have um, AWS bills that are usually between 200 and 400 per month. And for me to take this further and move towards continuous integration where I'm always testing um, commits to the, to the master branch, I, I have to be able to extend that ability in order to improve the reliability. Um, so thank you for being here today and uh, I look forward to being able to help others with this project.